All right. Who else will the Commonwealth have? The All right, the Commonwealth rest. All right, they rested. Okay, so that means everything that you've seen so far, they believe has proven that this defendant is guilty of triple murder beyond any and all reasonable doubt. Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae, who's in Elizabethtown, Kentucky tonight. Wow. Uh, also with us in Atlanta, Georgia, Superior and State Court Judge Gino Brogdon. Uh, great to have you both here. Julia, let me begin with you. Um, they rested. So, um, you know, most trials here, we've got like that big piece of evidence or, you know, that video that I witnessed, that DNA, the tire track, maybe a fiber, something. What do we have here, Julia Janae? What do we have? We have, first of all, it's like a totality of the circumstances. We have a shell casing. That was something that this jury got to see today. We have a hair that has similarities to the defendant. That shell casing matches the defendant's gun. We have his motive. That's a huge thing that the prosecution hopes that this jury latches on to. We also have those victim statements that they made to friends and family saying that they were worried that the defendant was going to kill them if they turned up missing. But as far as that smoking gun, you really can't point your finger at the defendant and say he did it. And that's really because of how this case was charged. They want you to think either he did it or if you don't believe he did it, he was definitely involved. Involved with whom? We don't know. The prosecution has not said anything. Uh, we now know that they've rested. And we can now definitively say the state does not know who was the accomplice, if there was an accomplice, but we know that they charged this as complicity murder, not flat out murder. And I can tell you from the investigator who presented this case to the grand jury, he said, we're charging it this way because we can't say for sure that he did it, only that we are sure he facilitated it. Okay, Judge Gino Brogdon, that, that's not a... I, and and I, I hand it to prosecutors, right? Prosecutors believe and in the investigation, they believe this is the man responsible and they're going to try it and they're going to try it. But um, it's, it's a huge burden in every case for prosecutors. What are your thoughts about um, where we are right now in this case and what this jury has heard? Well, Vinny, thanks for having me on tonight. I've got really two thoughts. One, it looks like the prosecution fell in love with the sex appeal of this case. You've got some infidelity, you've got a love triangle, you've got an accused that's ex-military, he's an active pilot. The case is sexy to try. The problem is, is they run straight into the standard of proof, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, a reasonable doubt is doubt for which a reason can be given, not just I have some doubt. Here, there's a lot of reasonable doubt. First, in charging this case, complicity means he, as you said, he did it with someone else. If you don't suggest who else he did it with and your evidence of him doing it is weak, you're in bad shape. I think the prosecution's in bad shape. As I watched this trial, I was looking for the big moment where I'd say, wow, there it is, but I didn't see it. I, I think their best chance is to undo his alibi defense. If they're able to show somehow that he wasn't at home with uh, his fiance, uh, then, you know, uh, then they've got a shot. If they don't make a crack in his alibi defense, I see an acquittal all day on this. Okay, well, one of the things that was talked about during the opening statement was the, um, the, the shell casing. Let's take a listen to that testimony today because we had some experts uh, talking about the shell casing that was found not by investigators uh, but by the victim's son and the victim's aunt who were in the house uh, months afterwards. Let's take a listen. There were consistencies in five different areas uh, between my standards fired in that gun and the evidence cartridge case that was submitted to me. And, and I determined, in my opinion, that cartridge case was fired by this 45 caliber pistol. 
So that was a positive identification? It was. Not inconclusive? In my opinion, that cartridge case was fired in that gun. Okay, Julie Janae, but I want you to clarify some things now. This is a 45 shell casing. This is the one not found by investigators, but by the victim's family. Um, I know there's a 22 involved here. There's allegedly a 45. Can you kind of lay it out for us? And, and, and how does any of this revert back to the defendant? Well, we have three victims in this case, one being Calvin Phillips, who the medical examiner determined was shot, killed, multiple gunshot wounds to the head. Inside his body was found a 45 caliber projectile or one that had similarities to a 45 project, uh, caliber projectile. And then you have this 45 Glock that was found in the defendant's home. The other two victims were shot with 22 caliber rifles. But that was also found in the defendant's home. But as far as the links and what the forensics show, they can't definitively say if the 22 caliber rifle that was seized from the defendant's home matches the 22 caliber projectiles that were found in the bodies of those two victims, Pam Phillips and Ed Donzero, who were found burned up in the car. The projectiles were damaged in that case. But this shell casing, the 45 uh, Glock shell casing, this witness on the stand today, Jeffrey Doyle, he was able to conclusively say that it matches the gun of the defendant. But I will point out that the person before him who testified, Leah Collins, she testified that she can't conclusively say that the projectile that was found in Calvin Phillips, the bullet, it was an RIP bullet, it is not one that she can confirm or deny came from that 45 Glock. All right, Judge, we don't have a smoking gun, but will, will smoking uh, shell casing get the job done here? A a again, uh, Julia, when is it found? Who finds it? Right. This shell casing was found five months after the murder. So April of 2016, found by the sister of the victim as she was cleaning up the home. Uh, she is seen on surveillance video there going and getting her nephew, who is the son of the victims. He sees it, gets authorities. They eventually come to the house and collect that shell casing found on the back porch, which is where the prosecutors believe that Calvin Phillips was killed. All right, Judge. The shell casing doesn't get it done here. It could. If this shell casing was found by the police, in the initial sweep of this property, then the shell casing would have more powerful meaning. But simply, even if they show it was shot from this gun, there are other explanations as to why a shell casing could be placed at the scene. So the, the five month amount of time that went by, who found it and the circumstances of it being found make it kind of queasy evidence. I don't think the shell casing brings it home. It's important to the prosecution. Their case rests on it because they need to put the defendant at the scene. But I don't think the shell casing evidence in light of how it's found, when it's found, and who found it will be enough. Not enough of a smoking gun. Okay, let's, let's listen to something else now. This is a different piece of evidence going away from the, the uh, gun evidence right now to um, Kit Martin's cell phone. Okay, so this is, I find this piece of evidence very intriguing. Let's take a listen. And what's next? Next at 11.27 p.m., the alarm application was opened. And again, there was a repeating alarm set for 6.40 a.m., but a new alarm was created at 11.27 p.m. And that alarm was set to, to go off or to alert at 1.10 a.m. And it was going to play the Top Gun uh, theme, or the Top Gun sound as its alert. So at 11.27 p.m., November 18th, the alarm is changed for 1.10 a.m., the 19th. That's correct. The, the, the alarm is, there's a new alarm created that says go off at 1.10 a.m. Okay, Julie J., plug this into the timeline here so we understand what this means. Um, he's resetting the alarm on, on his phone for 1.10 a.m.? Who sets the alarm for 1.10 a.m.? I didn't even set it for 1.10 a.m. when I was doing the morning show on Sirius. That is early, Julia. That is pretty early. I checked my alarms, and the earliest one I've ever set is for 3 a.m. because I had a 6 a.m. flight 
But the prosecution says that this falls into their timeline because they believe Calvin Phillips was killed at before 9 a.m. on the morning of November 18th, that his wife was killed along with the neighbor, Ed Donzero, around 5.30 in the afternoon evening, and that then someone came and got those bodies and took them to the Rosetown Road area, two and a half miles away from the house, two of those bodies, Pam Phillips and Ed Donzero, and burned those bodies in that car around 2 a.m. on the 19th. So the way that they want this jury to see that timeline is that this defendant set that alarm to wake himself up so he could go and dispose of these bodies. All right. I, I like this evidence, Judge. This is, uh, um, you know, all right, a smoking alarm? No, not really, and here's why. This evidence certainly is creepy. It makes us kind of creepy crawly about it. Why would this guy set an alarm like that? But all it does is it prompts the jury to say, Maybe he did it. Maybe he did this. He might have done this. But that's not enough to satisfy reasonable doubt. What the prosecution is doing here is much like taking a bunch of pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in a bowl and throwing it on the board where you put them together and saying to the jury, now you put all those pieces together and it comes up with this mosaic called a conviction. But you can't do that. The prosecution has to put those pieces together. They can't leave this weird alarm evidence kind of dangling out there for the jury to figure out where it fits. Could it indicate that the defendant was reminding himself to go and burn these people up? Sure. But I don't think that the way it's dangling that it does the job. Sexy, but not enough. All right, Julia, is there any explanation from the defense as to why this man would set an alarm for 1.10 a.m.? They've given us some indication in their opening statements. We expect it's going to be fleshed out a lot more once they start their case in chief on Monday. They say that the couple, Lauren Spencer and her boyfriend, Kit Martin, they were having problems sleeping. They were losing sleep over the court martial proceedings and the stress. And somehow they say that is going to explain this alarm, along with the fact that they have a kerosene heater and perhaps he was waking up to make sure it was off. So... We expect to learn a lot more about that once that case in chief starts for the defense. Yeah, well, if you're having trouble sleeping, you don't set the alarm for 1.10 a.m., okay? You, you don't do that. You're having trouble sleeping, you don't want anything to wake you up. You know, maybe you put, like, the little noise machine that makes the waves or something. Maybe that's kind of soothing. But if you want to sleep but and you're having trouble... <laughs> not Top Gun. Top Gun is not going to put you to sleep. That's going to get you uh, right in the middle of the danger zone here. So um, the kerosene heater, what's going on with that, Julia? They have a broken heater in the house? They What's the situation? Well, we keep hearing about kerosene, and we heard about it from the prosecution as well, defending the defense's motion for a directed verdict, because they say that's one of the pieces of evidence that they have, that this defendant had what looked like newer kerosene tanks inside his garage, and also that they used the, their version of luminol for these investigators, a Blue Star agent, and it, it hit as far as possibly blood being on the handles of those uh, those tanks. So they explain, the defense explains those kerosene um, tanks for the kerosene heater. And also now it's an explanation possibly for that alarm going off in the morning, maybe not wanting it to be on all night. All right, one, one more question on the 110. What do we know what time he goes to bed? When is the last time that we know he's awake if he's setting the alarm for 110? Well, what we know is that he set it at 11.27 p.m. the night before and that he was seen on surveillance video moving around at 11.46 and 11.47 p.m. So he likely went to bed after that if he's going to wake up at 1.10. Yeah, I'm going to get an hour of sleep and then wake up. Wait, that, see, see that's, that's fishy, Judge. All right, <laughs> Julia Janae uh, in Kentucky for us. Uh, awesome, awesome job. Uh, we will speak again. Thank you so much.